from Cheyenne, Wyoming, the woman who has now now finally launched her own fleet of private drones across Wyoming is Maureen Bader from Wyoming Liberty Group. Uh, today, apparently, we're going to be talking. This is perfect timing, Maureen. There's a lot of people who are gearing up to get ready to do a lot of outdoor Wyoming sports because springtime, you know, and that means you can finally get away from the ice fishing and get out there in real water and do some fly fishing. And with that, we're going to turn our attention to the game and fish department, which you've been writing about. The game and fish department is everyone's favorite department, and it is a bit of a different animal when we're looking at bureaucracies within the Wyoming government because it's got two budgets. A commission budget, which is traditionally funded through hunting and fishing licensing license fees, uh, federal funds, but it's also got what's called a general fund budget, and that's a budget that's funded from the general or through the through payments made by the general taxpayer. One of the problems with it, that's pretty typical with the Game and Fish Department is it's had its mission creep from something pretty straightforward, which was. Um, propagate, preserve, and distribute game animals, birds, and fish in the, uh, in the state to conserving wildlife and serving people, which as you can imagine could mean pretty much anything, and what do you know, it does. It pretty much means anything. Now, I, it's, before we get into some of these number breakdowns and some of how this mission creep has happened here, it still concerns me, Maureen, that they have two budgets. Have, has this ever become a conflict in the state of Wyoming, that they have a two budgets, and is one of them on the books and one of them off the books? Yeah, essentially, the Game and Fish Department is like uh, three other groups in the uh, agencies in the states. One, one is the Department of Transportation, which also has a commission budget, and also the community colleges and the University of Wyoming have got what we call off-budget budgets, which is sort of like a government term that doesn't, that's really a bit confusing. So you've got a budget that's under the purview of our elected officials and a budget that isn't. Now, it was Sue Wallace last year who brought forward legislation to actually bring both the Department of Transportation and the Game and Fish Commission budget, or the non-budget budget, under the purview of, the, of legislators. Uh, but throughout the, the session that we just finished, there was actually no talk of that particular budget. They did talk about it during the committee meetings that they had, and there was some talk about how the cuts have been made and in which parts of the budget and all of that. But when it came to actually analyzing what gets spent where and how, all we talked about during the session was the general fund budget, which is a very, very small part of the Game and Fish total spending. Okay. I just love trying to, trying to figure out what the off-budget budget is. But okay, now Game and Fish has continued to grow even just in the few years that I've been here in the state of Wyoming. Have they gone beyond what officially their mission was uh, supposed to be? In other words, some bureaucracies tend to expand themselves to the limits, push the limits to see how far they can take it. Has Wyoming Game and Fish done the same? Well, at the end of the day, and, and uh, Senator Bruce Burns made a very good point, what usually happens is that these legislators get pressure from special interest groups, and in, and in particular, in this case, unions and environmental groups, for the government to do something about some particular problem, a perceived problem. So what we've seen in the Game and Fish Department is a real explosion in what they call conservation activities, which really has got nothing to do directly with, with hunting and fishing, because a lot of times what it'll, what it'll be are animals that cannot actually be hunted, or, well, hunted anyway. One of those was wolves. And we'll get into grizzly bears in a minute. But what, what, what's what been happening with wolf, the wolf budget, for instance, is when it was protected and couldn't be hunted, the budget was about well, anywhere between about $700,000 and $600,000 or so. But now that it's been delisted, in other words, it, hunters can actually hunt, the, hunt wolves now in Wyoming in certain areas, um, which is a little bit more complicated than that. But I'll leave it at that for now. The the what, what the Game and Fish Department got in their last general fund budget was essentially a 143% increase in the, in the amount that they can supposedly spend to manage wolves, which is crazy when you think about it because, I mean, the federal government is no longer involved directly in managing wolves, and where the, the Game and Fish Department actually manages wolves is only a very, very small area outside of the 
uh, Yellowstone National Park. Now they monitor wolves all over the state, but when they're flying around, you know, counting deer, they can also count wolves while they're at it. So I mean, at the end of the day, the the, the issue is, are they just going to be able to spend as much as they want, just and justify that through fear tactics, or is it finally going to say, look, you know, you need to start prioritizing your activities, and stop just using fear tactics to get people to say, oh yes, we need to give them more money, otherwise, oh my goodness, the wolves will be relisted. Now, relisting would, would actually be a problem, but the wolf population is so far away from being relisted, and in fact, the Game and Fish Department themselves has to shoot wolves to keep keep the population at a certain level. I mean, the chance of being uh, relisted are very slim. So what, what we have seen is a big, big explosion in the Game and Fish budget. Wolves are a really good example of how that happens. And we, but in fact, in the last couple of years, uh, 2013 and 2014, fiscal 2013 and 2014, spending had actually gone way down. Now, part of the reason spending has 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 come under a lot of pressure is because hunting and license hunting and fishing license fee revenue has been going down. So what the department is doing, not it's not managing its costs better. No, it's trying to offload more and more of its escalating costs to the from the hunting and fishing group to the general taxpayer and this is I think where we're really going to see a problem in the future. I'm talking with Maureen Bader from Wyoming Liberty Group. So in other words, it, I mean if, if I'm running the business and I find that I'm getting fewer customers, things are slowing down, one of the things unfortunately I'll have to do and hopefully it's just temporary would be cut back on some of what I do in my business. So what you're saying is when we're dealing with government, uh, they don't cut their budget back, they just find a way to spend more money and then the question is going to be where are they going to get that money from? Where are they going to get the money from? I mean, wolf management is a really good example of of how they are able to actually offload these costs because you've got um, 475,000 to manage wolves in 2009-10, 740,000 in 2011-12, and then 608,000 in the last biennium. It's they've managed to get 1.5 million for this biennium, and and the and I mean the issue is that now they want to do the same thing with grizzly bears, and the it looks like so far the legislature is going to actually let them do it. Now they're spending all this money to manage wolves. How much are they actually generating in revenue, in in hunting license revenue? Well, they're generating in 20. 12, they generated about $190,000 in, in, in license fee revenue. So imagine you're a business. You're spending $600,000 roughly to generate $190,000 in revenue. Now you're going to spend $1.5 million to generate even less than $190,000 in revenue because Scott Talbot, the director of the Game and Fish Department, during one of the meetings we had with the Travel Committee, said, well, we actually are expecting to sell fewer licenses in the future because, you know, Wolves are hard to hunt, so people will tend to, you know, hunt something else. They're expecting to what sell fewer do? licenses, so less revenue. What does this do for the hunter out there? Uh, in other words, I, I hear a lot of complaints up here. There's a lot of hunters up in this area. They seem to be complaining about getting licenses and then the cost of these licenses. So if I were a hunter, is it gonna is it gonna start costing me more to get uh, hunting licenses or maybe other fees along the way? No, it's actually kind of interesting. I mean, if you're a conspiracy theorist, you might you might think that this is a little bit more than there's a little bit more going on than 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 would sort of meet the than, than it seems. Let's say because the the legislature has over the last couple of years managed to successfully not you know fix or stop any kind of legislation that the Game and Fish Department has been pushing through to increase hunting and fishing license fees. Um, the last in this last biennium in, in this last session, what was the bill that went through would have raised hunting and license hunting and fishing license fee revenue by about eight million dollars. That got nixed. But what did happen is that Senate File 45, the bill that would allow the Game and Fish Department to offload its healthcare costs and its grizzly bear management costs from the, their commission budget, or that sort of secret budget, to the general ta general taxpayer funded budget, is about seven million. So you have a lot of people saying, "Oh, that's funny how they they lost they lost the eight million here, but they're getting seven million here." You know, is there something more going on? Now, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist because you know a conspiracy like that would really actually take a lot of intelligent work. 
And if people were really that smart, they probably wouldn't. If people were really that smart, they'd probably be doing something where they're making a lot of money. They probably wouldn't be sort of trying to fiddle with their budgets. So, I, you know, the the issue here is that you've got now this bill, Senate File 45, which will allow this cost to shift. So it's a cost shifting bill. It's going to come up again in the 27. So it would come up again in the 2016 budget session, and what that. What what we need to do is get legislators aware of the fact that the Game and Fish Department isn't the only department that has non-general funds paying for its health care costs. I mean, when I was at the committee meetings, you had Scott Talbot standing up there saying, "Oh, gee, you know, we're one of the very few departments that has to fund our health care costs through the through hunting and licensing, so non-general fund funds." Whereas all these other agencies, they've got the general fund to fund their healthcare costs, and and you know I did a made a few calls, and one of the very very knowledgeable people that I spoke to up in, in government, because I mean you know I used to work in government. I'm not it's not like I've got something against government workers. You know there are a lot of really smart people working there. There are lots of um, not so smart people working there either, as well. So what this fellow um, t who's very knowledgeable in the government told me is that when the Game and Fish Department was able to actually convince legislators to do that, there were eyes were rolling because they're not one of the only departments. In fact, there are a lot of departments, all the boards, all the commissions, so the Department of Transportation, a lot of the, the colleges, the universities, a lot of them have got another budget that funds their healthcare costs. So the whole thing was a bit of a, a scam and it was a bit deceitful. And this is something we need to ensure that legislators are aware of next time around so that they prevent this from happening in the future. Well, I'd be curious. I don't know if you would know the percentage right off the top of your head, but how many, what percentage goes to taking care of feeding the bureaucracy and what percentage actually gets out to taking care of wildlife and trails and other things that they say they're going to be taking care of? Do you have any kind of number on that? Yeah, the last time I checked, so last year, about 62% of their budget goes to fund salaries. Now, that doesn't include the health care costs or the benefits. That's just salaries. And in fact, over the last, I forget, the, I think it's over the last five years or so, that was the last five years, their, health, their salary cost has actually gone up by 62%. So, you know, when you, when, one of the things that um, Representative Alan Yagi was trying to get the Game and Fish Department to do was to really tell them, okay, look, what are your priorities? What do we really need to fund? And they, they, they to date, have not given a list. And when I testified before that committee, I said, I can tell you what one of their priorities is. One of their priorities is higher salaries for themselves. And here's a really good example of how that's worked. Okay. Well, and, and boy, 62%. I hadn't even, I didn't think you were going to give me a number quite so big, but okay, here once again is the beast of government is more expensive than actually the job they're trying to get done. This is the example I've used of, you know, if I give a hundred dollars to the minister who's right next door here in the church, a hundred dollars goes to poor people. But if government comes and takes a hundred dollars to me, about a nickel goes to poor people. So when you pay for that licensing fee or whatever you might be paying for through game and fish or your tax dollars are taken from you, very little of it's actually getting to the projects. Let me ask you real quick about some of the projects that they have going on. I know there's snowmobile trails and we got wolves. I mean, just in your opinion, how much are they doing that they really should be doing as a game and fish department? And how many other projects have they picked up that really should be, frankly, none of their business, maybe even privatized? Okay, now, just just uh, one clarification. That trail maintenance, the snowmobile trail man maintenance, that's state parks and cultural resources. That's okay. a different okay. department. Okay. But what, yeah, the the issue here is that you've got a lot of special interest groups, especially the environmentalists, who are pushing for more and more of a conservation role. The the, the issue though is that the it's completely unlimited what they could potentially do, because there are lots of animals and plants that have these support groups that want the taxpayer to fund for to fund their their existence basically. Right. But what the Game and Fish Department really resists doing is bringing the private sector on to try to in, engage in some of this conservation activity because I mean think about it. Have, has there ever been the have cows ever been sort of at, at threat of extinction? No. Have buffaloes? Yes. Why? Because somebody owns those cows. Nobody owns those buffaloes. 
So the incentive for people is to go out and you know kill as many buffaloes as they possibly can, but you're not going to go out into your neighbor's yard and kill their cows. Why? Because the neighbor owns those cows. The, so what's happening then is when you enlist the private sector to help with conservation, as has been happening in some other states around, not too far from here, where you make these game animals an actual resource for the farmer, then you get this automatic interest of people, of just your general population, into actually conserving these animals instead of just forcing taxpayers to fund an ever-expanding bureaucracy to engage in conservation activities. This is the underlying issue here in this particular case. You know, I'd be very curious to find out, because I, I covered this uh, yesterday, how many people currently working for the Environmental Protection Agency used to work for some radical leftist environmental group, and they weren't really able to get a lot done. But now that they're in the EPA and working for the EPA, they can just basically sit there as bureaucrats and write all sorts of rules and regulations, which are laws, basically, to get done whatever is on their environmental agenda. I'd be curious to see how many people in Game and Fish Department actually at some point belong to some environmental group somewhere. Yeah, that, yeah, that I don't know. But what, we, what you do often see and what you're kind of talking about is something we call regulatory takeover. Right. So you've got a group that regulates a certain activity. And not so much that people in environment in environment in the environmental movement actually go and work for the game uh, for the EPA or the game and fish department but what happens is that they become they're a very very powerful special interest and they get regulations and rules and laws passed that benefit them that's regulatory takeover more Last segment with Maureen Bader of Wyoming Liberty Group, and you had sent me a note before all this started about consumptive consumption made me think I had to go see a doctor or something. What is that, Maureen? Well, you know, as I mentioned, the Game and Fish Department is looking hard for other sources of revenue. One of the things it's come up with is that, gee, you know, you've got all these people, they come into, into the state or people who live in the state, they're out there and they're looking at wildlife. They should have to pay for that. Lord. <laughs> they have they have non consumptively consumed wildlife. Mm -hmm. You think that's crazy. When I go, you know, people need to go to these travel committee meetings because you'll actually see people stand up. People from the lobbyists from the travel travel industry, unions, and the these environmentalists, and they'll stand up and they'll actually start talking about this thing and they call it non consumptive consumption. So so th just to, so people can understand what that means. I mean, think about it. You're walking down the street. You see a cake store. You look in that store and you think, wow, that cake looks really good. Store owner comes out of the store. He said, that'll be $5. And you say, what? And he says, yeah, you've just non-consumptively consumed that cake. You owe me money. This is what people are, it's, and I'm serious, this is what people are actually saying and doing when they go to these travel committee meetings, and, and, and it's crazy. Oh, the Game and Fish Department, poor things, they need more money, they're doing all this, this work, and I mean, I'm not saying that they don't do a lot of good work, because they do do a lot of good work, but unfortunately, because their mandate has crept so far away from what it is they're supposed to be doing, they start doing all, all these kinds of things they shouldn't be doing. They do some things really badly, like bird farms and, and fish hatcheries. They spend way more than the private sector would do. Instead of going out and being a savvy shopper, they just ask for more and more money, and then because they can't actually get higher hunting and, and fishing license fee, fee revenues, they, tr they try to do this budget switch, and then they come up with these very, I mean, I mean that's creative. Is that not creative? Mm -hmm. that, that's very creative, but what disturbs me is I used to go for these long walks when I was a kid, uh, down past these shops, and I would walk into, into a bakery, and I would just stand there and enjoy the aroma from time to time and just get a big smile from the baker, which means he could have charged me every time I walked in the door and just took a big whiff of the air right there. What happens if I go to a beach and I'm admiring all the little bikinis? Do I owe them a whole lot of money? That's getting into some bad territory. It's it's crazy, but these are the kinds of arguments that these, these uh, special interest groups are using. Mm -hmm. to support the Game and Fish Department in their drive to take more money out of your pocket. And if people don't be, start to become aware of this, start calling their legislator and start saying, look, you know, these guys have got to get their spending under control. They've got to rein in their activities. And the other thing, too, and I'm hoping to get an article out about this pretty soon, is that what, what, what underlies a lot of this 
mission creep with, at the Game and Fish Department is that you have these special interest groups who push law who push lawmakers to actually get the Game and Fish Department to do more. So a lot of this stuff, like fish fish hatcheries and like bird farms, are actually in legislation. In order for the Game and Fish Department to stop doing that, the very first thing that has to happen is that that legislation has to be amended. So that, those are some of the things that we're going to be pushing for during the next uh, supplemental session. And I look forward to reading those articles. Maureen, as always, pleasure having you on. Great being here, Glenn. See ya.